So good afternoon to everyone. I'm Brikena, the director of the Lifelong Learning Platform. Uh, warm we uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, interesting debate uh, organized by the uh, European Parliament Interest Group on Lifelong Learning, which is a co um, co-organized by two main organizations, the Lifelong Learning Platform and the European Association for Adults for Education of Adults. Um, and it's happening in the framework of the Lifelong Learning Week that is happening this week. Uh, lots of events going on, mostly and only <laughs> online, I would say, unfortunately, still online, uh, but uh, very interesting debates on different topics related to education and in particular this week uh, focusing on evaluation assessment methods and well-being being at the heart of the discussions um, unfortunately i have to apologize for our president Giuseppina tucci she was uh, supposed to be the the chair and welcoming you but unfortunately she had some personal uh, commitments and she could not be here with us, but I'm happy to jump in and 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 replace her, and uh, happy to to have you all in this uh, in this meeting. Um, maybe just quickly for those of you that um, are not probably uh, aware of the focus of the meeting and what we wanted to get out of this discussion, um, uh, I will just maybe quickly. Um, introduce the main, let's say, issues we would like to address uh, in this meeting. And then I will welcome our um, speakers uh, to enlighten us uh, from different institutional perspectives uh, on these concerns that are high at high stake uh, at the moment in the education and training policy agenda at the EU, but also member states level. And one of the issues, obviously, as you saw, is the funding of education. So we have from one side a uh, recent crisis, the many crises that are putting a lot of pressure in education and training systems. And on the other side, we have uh, a, a scary and worry trend of decreased public financing and public uh, support to um, invest in, in, in education and training. So two, two, two strands that don't, do not uh, fit with each other. And um, on the other side, the pandemic made mental health issues and health issues also um, very important uh, that, uh, and the role that education and training is called to play uh, in this uh, concern, in this development is also an important debate to have. So the idea is how can we uh, address these issues from one side, the needs for further investment and also uh, more attention uh, to be given to well-being of learners and education and training systems and such a high uh, and such such a high pressure uh, that the sector is um feeling from different uh, social uh, and economic developments that the union but not only globally we are uh, living in so um we have invited a few uh, a few speakers with us and i'm happy to welcome them one by one um and um we also have members of the parliament that have also joined us and we will give them the floor at the, at, at the right moment as well. Maybe we can, we can start with the panel while we wait for the chair of this uh, interest group um, and start maybe with the Slovenian presidency. Um, colleagues of uh, Emma uh, Perme that uh, is representing here today the Slovenian presidency. You are towards the end of the presidency, but it was a very busy one. So maybe you would like to have an introduction um to the to the topic and what was your main concerns and challenges during your presidency and how did you tackle some of the issues that i mentioned during your your presidency and yeah welcome you first and then uh, maybe i introduce the other speakers and then 
you, in the order that I introduce you, you can maybe take the floor one after the other. So I will uh, maybe also um, welcome Borhain Shakrun uh, from UNESCO, Director for Lifelong Learning Policies. Thank you for joining us as well uh, to bring this more global dimension uh, to the discussion. And we also have Dorota Siekiewicz. I'm sorry, my Polish is not very good. <laughs> uh, but you're joining us from EuroHealthNet. So very happy to have also this sector in the debates. Maybe we can kick off in the discussion in this order, um, the first introduction, and then we can have an open discussion and also have uh, all participants uh, hopefully uh, interacting through the chat uh, later on as well. So Emma, the, the screen of the floor is yours first. Thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you very much for your invitation and but also that we could participate actively at this event. Um, it's on behalf of Slovenian presidency and all the team that we are working at the education sector for it. Um, we are very keen on also that we have an opportunity um, to participate actively, very actively during the presidency, um, since we are uh, got the task actually to coordinate and to prepare the new uh, agenda for adult learning for the next period of time. Uh, so it was one of our priority uh, in education sector, but as well as uh, in the whole package of presidency. Uh, so um, maybe just a little bit about the process. Uh, how we've got the, the, the document that it was accepted this Monday uh, in Council of Europe. So um, it is legal and it is a kind of um, strategic legal framework for all the actions that we are going to have on adult learning um, for the next period uh, or the next decade. Um, Adult learning, as we know, is very fragmented still, and there is a lot of um, things that we need to cover in the next decade that we haven't done in the previous one. Um, but in a way, it's rational that we cannot do it all uh, the same. So the process went like that, that we prepared kind of background paper um, in the early months this year. And then we've, go, we've gone uh, with the process um, discussing with different stakeholders, uh, not only in the country, but in the whole Europe. So it means um, that we join together, um, unfortunately, only online, not in live uh, situations. But anyway, uh, we had a great discussion about what we need for the next period. Uh, what, is, uh, what are our um, priorities? So maybe just to um, say to you, what was, uh, what, has, what are kind of crossing matching topics uh, that we put in the agenda? So it's focused on green and digital transition. Um, so the next generations, but also these generations that are getting older and older um, should be equipped very good for this transformation. And then the governance and partnership uh, in adult learning is also very important as we realize through the decades. So we need kind of holistic cross-sector government approach uh, at European national, but also um, down there to regional and local levels. Uh, the next uh, topic is strengthening the quality in um, uh, awareness raising, guidance, and um, outreach activities, which is very much linked to the next one, uh, which is inclusion and equity. And uh, we need also put a lot of effort uh, in general in lifelong learning culture in the whole society in Europe. Uh, so um, the well being is the word that uh, I've been linking today, also the new agenda, which was approved um, by the Council. And we put this well-being um, in a few chapters in the uh, agenda, which is very much linked, as I said, uh, with all these issues that we have um, uh, linked to megatrends, which mean demography problem problems, uh, 
but also intergenerational learning and connections that we need to build up better uh, learning in uh, different kinds of communities. Uh, so it means in uh, smaller communities, but also wider in the society, uh, in companies and in other, um, all kinds of sectors, not in educational only, but only in all policies that we need to cover um, the issue of adult learning to be better and better and to equip people as well as we can uh, for their work and life situations uh, for the future. Maybe this would be uh, enough for, for the very beginning of it. Thank you very much. So we'll be then uh, Borin Shakrun. Uh, you have a totally uh, maybe a more more global um, perspective into the issue, uh, which is very interesting. And you have been also running this global education coalition. So maybe you would like to share with us as well on the EU, on the international level. How do you see this uh, this issue of funding on one side and well being on the other side? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brikin, and uh, good afternoon uh, to colleagues. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you today and to discuss uh, a very important topic that you you kindly put uh, uh, for uh, our discussion uh, related to financing. But I think uh, uh, what uh, uh, was important is what Emma was mentioning is the this a broader um, framework that we have to consider in the broader context and the element related to transitions, uh, be it uh, technological, uh, the climate and green transition, but the demographic transitions. And uh, I would say uh, other element of transitions that are related to the uh, societal uh, aspect, the, the democracy uh, challenges and, and uh, engagement aspect related to something that we tend to maybe underestimate the informality of uh, uh, labor market, for example, including in the gig economy. So, um, so these are uh, elements that are important. Uh, the, the challenge in terms of the uncertainty uh, regarding the economic recovery, and, and we see uh, with the with the, unfortunately the last uh, developments on the uh, the the variants that uh, we are still uh, in uh, in a situation of a lot of uncertainty and volatile uh, context, and that the the COVID uh, impact has been uh, very uh, dis disrupting for uh, education system for learning for lifelong learning uh, more broadly, and it continued to be. Uh, today, we still have millions of uh, learners who are not in schools globally, uh, where countries are either uh, fully or partially closed because of the COVID uh, situation. So uh, I think it's important to, to take into account uh, this context. Now, um, when it comes to uh, education financing, I would like to uh, first uh, uh, share with you, and I'm, I'm sure uh, most of colleagues are aware, uh, we, uh, two weeks ago, we have adopted the, the Paris Declaration, which is a declaration on um, in the global education meeting that uh, uh, met in, in Paris and, and was co-hosted by UNESCO and the, uh, the government of France. And uh, I think the, the emphasis on financing was uh, a very important and, and uh, very uh, critical for the discussion. Why? Because first of all, um, when we take it at the global level, uh, in 2015, we have adopted some benchmarks related to uh, the percentage of GDP that has to be allocated to education and training between four and six, uh, related to uh, public expenditure allocated to education and training between 15 and 20 percent. But we, we see that um, uh, uh, around 47 percent of the countries are not meeting those benchmarks. And this is an, an, a concern for us. The second concern uh, is that um, with the COVID, with the, with the demands, uh, there is a need for more resources to be allocated to education and training. And uh, that cannot come uh, uh, from uh, what is being available today. And that there is a more attention to the fiscal uh, um, ecosystem and, and framework. And, and we need to increase the cake so that the cake that is allocated to education and training can increase. And the trade-offs, of course, in the whole government uh, approach. And that's a second aspect that um, we discussed it in Paris, and it comes in the Paris Declaration. The third aspect, which is, uh, I think, very important, and it's important that a platform like uh, our today uh, has a, a, a voice on it, is that uh, we have once in a generation investment for recovery, the stimulus packages. 
And uh, when we look at uh, the, allocate, the resources allocated to education globally, it's less than 3% of the uh, overall amount allocated for the stimulus packages. Of course, there is, there is a variation across countries. Some countries might allocate uh, around 12%, while others will allocate 0, 0, 0, 0.005%. But the, the average is still uh, low. It's low uh, when we take uh, the global uh, average is low when we take also uh, low and middle income countries. And uh, it's important that uh, when we are discussing in terms of the advocacy that we can play, that we, we uh, raise the voice that uh, um, this once in generation investment has to uh, uh, allocate resources to education because education and training and lifelong learning are uh, human rights, but because there is also an economic return on uh, investment in education and lifelong learning. I think uh, that's uh, an important aspect. Let me finish with the last um, uh, input and then of course uh, we'll have a, a second round of probably of, of intervention. Um, when we, we focus on uh, uh, financing of lifelong learning, I think we need to focus on three elements that are important. One is uh, the resources and uh, the mobilization of resources. The second is uh, equity of the uh, use of resources. Uh, resources have to be used in an equitable manner, have to be centered on the most disadvantaged, the low skilled adults who, who by all the data we know that they are not accessing to lifelong learning opportunities. And that um, as uh, we, have, we use this metaphor in the banking, money goes to the rich, skills go to the uh, talented and, and skilled persons. And it's very important that uh, the equity dimension is, is important. And then of course, efficiency. In, in some cases, you need to use in an efficient manner, the resources that are allocated to education and training and, and particularly when we speak about lifelong learning perspective. But let me stop there. I, I hope I will have a, another moment of intervention with the more focus on the right basic perspective that is uh, very uh, close to our uh, attention and, and the content that relates to the well-being and other aspects that probably we need to discuss on a second tour. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm looking forward to that aspect as well because I think it's it's uh, one way to, to indeed look at the issue um, of, of funding. Um, I was told that the MEP uh, Piet Kainen has also joined us, so maybe we can still continue our um, order of interventions and give her the floor instead and in, uh, welcome her maybe to the panel. So Sirpa, if you would like to join us to the panel, we will put you in the spotlight. And have you just after Dorota, if uh, that's fine? And uh, let's see how this flexibility and change to the agenda can still make this discussion good enough. <laughs> so Dorota first, and then uh, we'll leave it the floor to, um, to Sirpa. Yes, thank you so much, Rikana. Uh, I will be very quick for this first round of uh, um, interventions. And I couldn't agree more with the, um, uh, the other speakers, uh, what was mentioned about, you know, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to use the recovery resilience uh, stimuli, stimuli to, to invest in, uh, in the dearest uh, things uh, that we have, which is the people, uh, people's uh, assets, um, uh, and and uh, people's well-being, um, and I, I will come here from a slightly different perspective. So, not directly uh, involved, uh, not being directly involved in in policies at the EU level uh, dedicated to um, education, training, skills, lifelong learning, uh, but taking on those issues nonetheless uh, from a public health perspective. Um, uh, I, I work for EuroHealthNet, which is a, a European partnership for health equity and well-being, but we address inequalities in, in health from um, social economic, uh, I'd say digital, commercial, environmental uh, determinants of health uh, perspectives and education actually and people's skills literacy uh, come always very high uh, when we talk about you know the smart ways of investing uh, our 
uh, quite limited, I have to say, resources as well in public health field, in, in the field of health promotion, disease prevention. Um, and as I said, uh, um, investing in education, in people, um, uh, lifelong learning, continuous professional development. And here I, uh, I take it to the um, mostly to the health professionals and, and social, I'd say, uh, workforce. It always comes quite high, uh, proves to be um, uh, an investment on uh, a high return, uh, depending on the level of governance it's, it's invested. So, um, you know, when we talk to the governments, to um, uh, to the ministries, it's it's the, uh, an area that we recommend for, um, uh, for prioritization of, of investments. And um, uh, uh, we have been working with the uh, multi-annual financial frameworks uh, at the EU level and within uh, several EU funds and programs for a while already. And uh, here specifically for us, it's the European Social Fund, uh, EU for Health Now, uh, Horizon Europe. So all the funds that the EU has put uh, at place to um, you know, invest, invest the money that we have, the taxpayer money into into areas that are important to to us but also now um uh, uh with this uh, recovery and resilience facility um uh, funds that are huge um we've uh, we've analyzed uh where those funds uh um were uh, decided to be uh, uh, to be put uh, towards, and um, uh, we uh, analyzed. We performed an analysis of the uh, of the eight countries' uh, recovery resilience plans: uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, Finland, Slovenia, Italy, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands. Um, and one more, Austria, yes, right. Um, looking at basically whether the member states um, and the ministries of health, I'd say, and social affairs seized really the opportunity to apply the, those available recovery-oriented funds to really build back and build back better and build back further um, in ways that are, uh, you know, systematically, structurally and sustainably uh, strengthening health equity and well-being. And, um, uh, and actually from the health equity and well-being perspective, again, uh, we've noticed that uh, despite the fact that uh, a lot of money has been put um, seemingly towards, you know, strengthening health, uh, health systems, it was predominantly from this biomedical perspective, so the curative treatment management of diseases, uh, very specialized um, uh, ways in which we understand health is being um, uh, built, but not from the resilience building perspective. So not as much uh, the investments uh, were put or prioritized towards, uh, you know, promoting promoting health, promoting uh, primary health care, community, uh, community care, improving people's lives from um, a variety of, of perspectives. So, um, and as I said, we, we don't really work on, on education, life, lifelong learning as much directly. Uh, nonetheless, from our analysis, what our um, our members, our, our experts that we talked to told us is that um, um, actually investments in um, uh, learning, building capacities and competences of uh, families, uh, uh, people, by that I also mean, uh, you know, uh, investments in education in early years, but then throughout uh, people's lives um, are very important, uh, investing in digital inclusion and skills, and here specifically in uh, digital health literacy, because this is where um, a, a lot of um, health delivery, I'd say, but even social care delivery is taking place these days and um uh, and by by this these channels 
uh, there is um, there's a lot of opportunity, of course, to improve people's health, people's lives, people's educational outcomes. But because of the kind of parallel um, digital exclusion of certain uh, uh, vulnerable groups, um, this potential uh, cannot be fully utilized. So our, our members, our experts told us this is also an area that has to receive adequate um, attention, political attention and financial attention. Uh, also, also, when we talk about the health and social care workforce, not only uh, are there uh, severe shortages, as we all, um, of course, know, uh, also in terms of um, uh, uh, educational um, uh, staff, um, but those those care uh, those workers are um, uh, not adequately uh, uh, supported uh, um, from a I'd say psychosocial perspective. So mental health investments in mental health, mental health well being, resilience, uh, emotional, uh, social skills uh, also come uh, came very uh, very strong. Uh, um, forward. Uh, so basically, I, I don't want to take more time. I'm, I'm sure it will come back later. But um, uh, long story short, we see a lot of a lot of uh, uh, relevance and parallels between, you know, investments in um, uh, uh, education, investments in training, uh, people's skills, literacy, competences, and seizing the opportunities that are there uh, in the health promotion, disease prevention uh, uh, area, working uh, cross sectorally and uh, supporting each other. Uh, for us, it's important that this um, inclusion and equity uh, dimension comes uh, strong forward, as as was mentioned by um, uh, UNICEF already. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, there is there are severe shortages in in the in the funding, and we definitely want to want to close this gap to to really make the full um, opportunity and, and use of the of the funds that are there and uh, at the moment and not yet uh, adequately uh, kind of stressing this and this area of using them to to recover to to uh, to build uh, resilience and get. Uh, prepared better uh, against um, uh, future crises, be it health-wise, climate change-wise, uh, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorota. And indeed, I mean, I, I, I did hear from you that uh, we need more preventive policy rather than just curing, which can be more a short reaction, short-term reaction to crisis. And education, investing in education can be a preventive measure also to other social sectors like uh, health as well. Um, but let's welcome our chair of the interest group, Sirpa Pietki, Pietikainen. Um, I don't know if she can hear us and if she is ready to, to speak, but I saw her camera moving around somewhere in Finland, I guess, because <laughs> we know she, that she is based in, in Finland. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please do use the chat to everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of people with a lot of knowledge and expertise on this topic. We want to get out uh, of this meeting with some concrete ideas that can be used for the, the year to come. We are also going in 2022, going to focus on the issue of investments even farther. This year was well-being and assessments. But please, yeah, do join the discussion through the chat, do raise questions to the speakers. Um, and we, I will try to, to um, address them. Uh, so, Sirpa, do we have you? Yes, you do. Welcome. I'm being a bit late. No worries. Yes, uh, perfect. Just, uh, speaking in the IMCO committee about product policy, and so was delayed for, uh, with a couple of minutes from your beginning. But so far, thank you for a very interesting and up to the point uh, discussion. And I think it is very important to see that uh, this is a question of a lifelong learning and education. But not only that, we need to very strongly put the emphasis on accessibility, especially in digital devices, so that they are accessible to everybody by technology, but also by language and the, uh, the easy to use uh, design, because otherwise uh, we are running 
late always with the new developments of the technology. So I just wanted to underline this. Then the second point, what we had already in discussion is the fact that we concentrate too much on the education on uh, technology and uh, pharmaceuticals uh, side and the tacit knowledge about communication and empowering of the people to understand of their well-being about uh, uh, <clears throat> the health side, but the societal uh, side too is overlooked. And that's why I would like to emphasize that kind of a lifelong learning where in one hand we would uh, concentrate much more on analyzing what causes inequalities in society, what are the root causes of change, to name the Green Deal, for example, that is going to cause a lot of uh, restructuring of our technologies and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, social services side, plus then uh, really putting the people on center on uh, deciding what kind of a societal needs they have, that is the uh, personal budgeting and designing of the social security uh, on one side and on the other side on the health, uh, what actually causes health problems and how you can prevent them and take early access and to uh, make, and this is very important, the very pivotal role for patient organizations, societal NGOs and others there, because quite often people do need that kind of a intermediaries to explain, to speak in behalf and uh, to be part of that process. Very happy to continue this discussion and uh, to hear what you have, uh, have to say for us. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we can open maybe the discussion now and uh, we had uh, good introductions from you. I took away some messages and maybe to kick off the discussion and have a second round of inputs from you. Uh, I, I was um, somehow um, thinking of this, what you, uh, Borhain, mentioned when it comes to the equitable use of resources. And I think that's actually why we are here and discussing further needs for investment in education and training and lifelong learning in particular, because we know that empowering the empowers is not the issue we are discussing here, <laughs> uh, but is rather how to make, make it possible and accessible to everyone uh, to not feel excluded from the society and we can be excluded in many different ways and uh, mental well-being or well-being in general and health is also one way to exclude uh, individuals from the society and we know that also education plays quite a key role key role in, in, in well-being of, of citizens so maybe we can continue these discussions what can we actually do uh, how can different resources uh, be put together what can policy making how should policy making change in a way to uh, to adapt to this, um, is there a magic solution <laughs> that either your um, institution or organization uh, is uh, advocating for or promoting? Um, and uh, yeah, if you would like to, to share on this. Um, you, you would like to uh, start maybe, Brahein? Yeah, I can come in. Thank you. I think uh, the, the point you are highlighting and also uh, what are the policy measures that uh, we, uh, government can consider and, and uh, uh, their effectiveness and what do we know from, from the international experience? Let me mention uh, three aspects that are, from my point of view, important. Uh, the first one is, uh, let me call it a, a legislative or regulatory uh, aspect, is, is our government setting up uh, the right legal framework for uh, a right to lifelong learning? And the right to lifelong learning, uh, we need to take it uh, from a, a much broader aspect. I think uh, Dorota was mentioning the link between health, uh, well-being, and, and, and lifelong learning. Uh, uh, the Honorable uh, MP was mentioning uh, also the aspect related to connectivity. Uh, so I think uh, we need to take this uh, important uh, element of uh, the lifelong learning and the right to lifelong learning and uh, see 
are government putting uh, the right uh, policy measures around them? And I can mention some of them. For example, if we take uh, at the European level, but also in the case of um, France, in the case of uh, outside Europe, uh, Singapore, now uh, Korea, uh, in a different contexts, Australia, about uh, lifelong learning entitlement or learning entitlement or learning accounts, wherever would be the, the terminology. So I think that's an, a, a clear aspect of uh, how we can advance more human-centered and, and more uh, targeting uh, specific groups that are not necessarily benefiting from uh, the, the investment in, in, in lifelong learning. The second aspect uh, beside the legislative is uh, more uh, the, uh, the program and the quality of the programs. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Emma or, um, or maybe Dorota mentioned, mentioned those aspects, is, is the offer uh, of quality and, and how we are looking at the quality of this offer, uh, its relevance, uh, its uh, uh, regulation, uh, sometimes uh, about the quality assurance of these uh, programs. Uh, I think this is an aspect that uh, requires probably, uh, again, government intervention, uh, either uh, in terms of creating a regulatory framework or creating incentives for the providers and for the actors. And the third aspect, which seems to me uh, an important uh, element, is uh, how we are targeting the most marginalized. And, and, uh, uh, and as we say in, in uh, UNESCO's uh, Global Monitoring Report, all means all. Not, uh, not only a specific group, but how we are inclusive of all uh, uh, learners and all citizens. And I think uh, that's something that requires probably multi-layers um, intervention and considering not only government, but consider uh, civil society. And, and this platform is, uh, I would say, the case in point of uh, how you mobilize civil society it is about uh, private sector uh, as well and, and their responsibility is about communities. So I think uh, that um, multi-stakeholders and sometimes a whole of government approach that is required is an important aspect that uh, we need to take into account. And uh, I would say that uh, in this case, uh, we shouldn't expect only from the government we should also uh, make responsible and accountable other stakeholders that have to play a role and, and can play a role. And uh, some of them are already playing a role in, in this context. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma or Dorota, you would like to, to come in? Dorota? Sure, yeah. maybe, maybe I can I can take the floor. Uh, immediately a kind of linking to, uh, to what Borhin just said. And I, I actually, um, again, <laughs> couldn't agree more. This um, uh, um, a proportionate universalism uh, approach to, 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 to uh, yes, we need targeted approaches to, uh, to really reach out uh, and really make sure that um, the vulnerable groups, as, as they are called, although we know that the kind of concept of vulnerability is, is really evolving. And with the pandemic, now we saw uh, people who maybe didn't even consider themselves vulnerable before suddenly found themselves uh, um, in the middle of it all. Um, but yeah, so uh, yes, targeted approaches, really specific interventions, personalized and, and etc. However, uh, we uh, shouldn't um, uh, shouldn't allow this to a kind of lose uh, the kind of population wide approach. Uh, out of sight, because then we see uh, certain certain people, certain individuals, uh, you know, pockets of poverty uh, arising and people uh, slipping through the uh, through the nets. So, uh, so as I mean, in, in a public health field, we uh, we follow this proportionate universalism approach, uh, following the um, uh, Professor Mahmoud's uh, approach here. Um, uh, interventions um, uh, where they are needed, for whom they are needed, with an intensity uh, uh, that's needed to 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 meet the uh, the needs and 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 the demand, I'd say. But of course, for that, that's the that's the um, that's the demand side. For that, we have to work on the supply side. So that uh, really, when we look at the, you know, uh, where who is going to. 
uh, uh, to do the job, uh, it, it's it's basically there, and and uh, the system is well equipped, uh, is equitable, accessible, uh, sustainable, uh, well financed. Uh, you know, civil society is included, uh, patients, uh, the users, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a kind of co-creation uh, process is really. In factored in uh, from uh, yeah from 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 per default I'd say so yeah I indeed fully fully agree on the co-creation side or when it comes to policy as well I think uh, it's it's a yeah. new way we should definitely uh, but maybe Emma you want to also from yeah maybe yeah thank you uh, also because I see some um, hands up already yes. in the public so i will be short but i couldn't agree more with <laughs> both borchem and uh, dvorota that we need uh well actually practical solutions on the field uh this is the most crucial one and a lot of connections done among all kinds of actors that they're on the field of adult learning uh, but also in other education sectors. So it means the whole rainbow of lifelong learning must be uh, very much linked. Um, but maybe just uh, to emphasize the thing that we have been thinking, uh, preparing this document uh, that I put you at the link also um, in the chat, uh, it's the funding of adult learning, which is uh, in a way in Europe uh, very unstable in most of the countries. So we are kind of lean on only on European funds that we are actually as European members, member states uh, putting in the money and then if we succeeded getting back and then plan different measures and instruments. Um, so we put this emphasizing of stability and sustainability of funding for adult learning for the next period which is crucial in a way, especially as you emphasized uh, already for vulnerable groups and those that they're low skilled, low educated. And as Bohemia um, said, <laughs> skills go to higher skilled. Yes, unfortunately, we don't have a balance and public funding must be focused on those the most needed uh, that they develop their skills, their abilities, and their abilities to participate in democratic society, but as well uh, develop their personalities and their uh, soft skills, we could say, uh, be resilient enough for the future. So thank you. Thank you, absolutely. I saw also a very interesting comment, so I invite maybe the speakers to look at it, or I will read it after the next um, intervention that I see Elisa Gambardella from Solidar and also Lifelong Learning Platform that has raised her hand. Uh, we'll give you the screen floor. I don't know anymore how we call this, but <laughs> uh, happy to hear from you and then uh, uh, also go back to the comment in the chat. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Brickena, and thanks to, to all the speakers. I think um, you, you have been sparking a lot of thoughts, so apologies if my intervention will be uh, a little confusing maybe now, but um, I will also, I will actually start from the comment that was just sent in the chat um, by Dorota, because uh, indeed we do have already uh, the recognition of the, the right to lifelong learning, the European pillar of social rights. What Boren was saying before, to move um, not away, but to expand the right to education to the right to lifelong learning is indeed something that could be uh, very interesting uh, in terms of uh, exploration also for making this right uh, more binding and therefore to allow for more funding towards this. So I'd like to, to know also what um, the other speakers think about this, if they consider this potential expansion of the right to education a way forward for allowing for more um, and more structural funding, as it was said, also for adult education and in general for lifelong learning. And um, additionally, uh, and I believe it would be uh, very important because like Brikena was also saying in the introduction, the um, major uh, societal uh, challenges we face now cannot be addressed only by uh, formal education. So especially when it comes to adult education, but not only, only lifelong learning can, um, 
can address this more uh, effectively, especially thinking about the green and digital transitions, but not only. Uh, and it was also said, and I totally agree, that um, public spending, uh, the public sector in general, cannot be enough, uh, also for the reason that I mentioned before. But at the same time, it remains essential. So I'd be curious to hear if uh, the speakers, what the speakers think uh, when it comes um, to the review of the macroeconomic governance of the European Union, if they believe that in this review it would be possible to uh, exclude the expenditure in education from the fiscal compact, allowing for member states to invest in education more freely and therefore to support better the sector as a whole. And um, indeed, let's say expenditure in lifelong learning and not only in education, if we are to adopt this concept. And um, additionally, uh, we also know that um, we already know that the public sector is not enough, right? Indeed, we're here as we cite organizations with the members working on the ground to support also the public authorities in providing a lot of um, transversal uh, key competencies, especially to the most vulnerable communities that the public sector can more hardly reach out to on a normal basis. So um, I totally agree and uh, I'm very, I was very happy to hear about the whole community approach, which was mentioned, as well as the co-creation process and the multi-stakeholders involvement and the stakeholders involvement, sorry, for multi-stakeholders partnerships to involve such uh, actions. But uh, when it was mentioned, um, the private sector, which of course should be involved as well and not excluded, I would also like to highlight that um, the commodification of education is on the rise since years. And I believe, especially when we think about um, life, this is a concern for Solidar Foundation in general, but also when we think about lifelong learning, how do the speakers believe that if we leave um, if we uh, let the private have a very relevant role in providing what we are now considering key transversal skills for all in the future, how can we make sure that the public interest remains central and pursued in terms of objectives if it's uh, up to private um, organizations to, to deliver it? So I would like to hear uh, what they think. Um, so the foundation consideration on this and the LLP as well is that it, it's pretty simple so that private actors will always be uh, profit driven. So uh, it remains a challenge to make sure that the public interest is uh, pursued. So uh, sorry if I was a bit long, uh, I hope not confusing and I'm really curious to hear what the speakers think. Thanks. Thank you very much, Elisa. Uh, I see another hand from uh, our friend Russell um, UK. If you would like to also maybe address the speakers or, um, yeah, certainly will share uh, with thank, us. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction, our friend Russell. I, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll add that to my title, I think. Thank you. At uh, least on Twitter, more, we are very good friends. <laughs> very good friends, yeah. And obviously, it, it, with our connections as well. Uh, yeah, great observations, fabulous presentation, and I've been active in the chat box, uh, exchanging email addresses and things with colleagues. Uh, just a couple of things. We take health, as you know, direct into the community, and I'm the CEO of a, a health organisation, and we've been doing that for 20 years, and it kind of fits in with my comments about lifelong learning, because the community don't often realise how important their health is until you make them aware of the fact they're not well. Because like a lot of things in life, people aren't very good at taking care of their health until they become ill. So when we take our community health events direct into the community, and I'm talking about 2,000 visitors per event, and we have about six a year. And as mentioned just before, we've been doing this 20 years now, and I'm the CEO of this organization, working alongside clinicians, nurses, university, medical students. You know, we find diabetes, we find all kinds of problems, and we can luckily uh, red flag them into our hospitals the following week. And then they become aware of how important health is. And it's a little bit like my follow on conversation to lifelong learning. Adults, in my experience, don't appreciate lifelong learning until they're exposed to it. And we have for many years been inviting the community and the public into our university, getting involved in lectures, 
getting them involved in delivering keynote speeches based on their personal lived experiences and active citizenships. And th th these guys have become university students. When I introduced the creative uh, uh, writing program to the university about 10 years ago, uh, the guys that I introduced, and they were the harder to reach in society, you know, the seldom heard voices as we call them. These were the homeless, the abused, you know, the addicted. Not only did they benefit so much from that process, they are now teaching the next generation. And they would no interest in lifelong learning. We're interested in it, we're involved in it, but actually you'll find a lot of people would never step through the door of uh, a, a higher education institute or a third sector organization to seek lifelong learning. But if you can expose them to them, expose, if you can expose it to them in a different way, by inviting them to something else, then they see the benefits of it. And I'm, I'm a victim of this. I left school with no qualifications. I turned my life around at the age of 48, 49, when I sold my successful business. And now I've been titled, I've been awarded, I've been published. And I didn't have any interest in lifelong learning until I was exposed to it. And consider I'm married to a teacher, you would think I would know better. But it was that first visit to her primary school when she said, come and work with my primary school children. That literally a light bulb went off. And then that took me into higher education and the rest is history. So it's, this is a great topic and I'm sorry I've taken too much of your time. No, thank you very much. It's always very inspiring to hear real stories you know from people that have experienced lifelong learning and value it and and i definitely agree that that's one definitely an issue that everyone is aware of and especially in lifelong learning adult education that the motivation and bringing and reaching out to the adults it's it's one of the challenge that uh, we are facing um there were a lot of comments and questions um, for the speakers, so it's up to you to to maybe decide which of the of them speaks to you and would like to to act, uh, to react on. Um, who would like to, Berhain? I see your microphone on. I can come in and uh, I thank like you. what. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bikan, and I, I like what uh, Elisa and Russell uh, was was referring to, and also that we address some of the questions that uh, are not easy to address. And uh, for example, uh, the private sector uh, involvement, and I think uh, we should be guided by uh, uh, our principle, which is that uh, education and lifelong learning is a public good, and is a right. That's the principle. Now, uh, when we move to, so how to deliver? I think is there where uh, we need to look at uh, what could be the contribution of each stakeholder from their contrib their uh, space and their place, uh, the importance of social dialogue, for example, in some contexts. Uh, when uh, we, we just finished the report, we will be publishing it uh, uh, very soon, uh, looking at uh, the training funds. Globally, we have around 70 countries who have a training fund. That is, um, uh, in a way, uh, uh, paid, or at least the uh, resources are coming from contribution from employers and employees. So I think it's important uh, that those resources, their governance, uh, their uh, policy direction are also uh, equity oriented. Of course, they have to meet demands also from economic uh, dimension, but they have to be also equity oriented. And uh, equity has to, to be uh, at the center of uh, any uh, policy action. Now, there is something that I, and uh, uh, Dorota put the uh, the pillar, the social uh, right pillar, and I think it's important. One aspect that, for example, we can learn from um, a country like Japan. Uh, until now, at least my understanding uh, of the, uh, for example, the learning accounts uh, in some uh, European countries has been focusing on uh, active population, meaning uh, before you retire, okay? Uh, and the retirement age is changing, of course, but still, uh, the perspective is that you need skills or you need lifelong learning as far as you are in the job market. But the life expectancy uh, is, uh, is going higher and higher, uh, and, and people are living uh, uh, in a healthier uh, uh, situation and in a better uh, shape much longer. But they need to learn, and the lifelong learning is not uh, related only to jobs. It is related to life. 
And uh, for example, uh, a Japanese uh, policy on lifelong learning is uh, uh, what, what they call 100, uh, li 100 years life cycle. I think that's what uh, a European uh, context, given the demography, has to go to. The, the elder population requires uh, lifelong learning, requires opportunities. And what Russell was saying is, is very important that um, you need to bring people to lifelong learning, probably uh, by uh, bringing opportunities, by offering a new ways of, of engaging lifelong learning. That is not necessarily the entry through um, the learning dimension, it can be entry through social integration, through community participation, through voluntary uh, engagement. And that's what, what can create maybe more appetite and, and more engagement in lifelong learning. I think we need to take this more, we, when we speak about child, we speak about the whole of child approach. I think we have to speak about whole of human approach in a lifelong learning perspective. Over to you. Wow. Thank you. Well, him, thank you very much for that. And also Russell and Elisa. Um, I see this conversation as a brainstorming in a way. So we bring up uh, all the ideas that we've got. I mean, it's so many actions and so many events going on in nowadays uh, through the internet. And yesterday I participated in one, um, the OECD was the organizer, but all the countries that we have been involved in skill strategy process uh, are having kind of um, peer learning workshop every year. So um, three countries, or actually four countries have been uh, presenting their activities uh, during the process. And one was the Colombia. And Bohemia just actually <laughs> remind me on that because they started the activities, how to, in a way, uh, raise up the motivation, passion, innovation uh, among young people through different kinds of activities, through different kinds of social media and different kinds of um, actions to help them, uh, well, actually to raise up life skills, especially for young uh, women, uh, which they have pre-pregnancy um, situations and they need to handle their daily life. So it means, I mean, yeah, our society should be in a way exposed to learning at every moment, at every time. And we should be aware of that, that this is something that is, uh, I don't know, it's a vital role that we have on this earth. Otherwise we are lost. If we don't learn, we don't exist in a way. So, um, uh, so go back to this um, pillar of social rights. Uh, when we have been actually um, getting this, I mean, the member states and policies in member states um, to, I don't know, to comment and um, to put our targets for the next decade. Uh, I think it was the first time uh, that we had this kind of very um, uh, visible cross-sectoral approach uh, to kind of consolidate what target is going to be reached um, uh, to succeed uh, linked to adult learning, which is, I mean, it's uh, participation in lifelong learning. So it was also health sector, it was also um, uh, employment sector, uh, and it was crucial that we consolidate what our country could do in the next period of time. I mean, the ambition of Europe is very high and it's put it very high. I'm, well, actually, I do believe in learning and in people, but I mean, for, for these numbers that we have participation in lifelong learning, uh, <laughs> I'm not very, very optimistic, but hopefully we could manage it. But regarding um, uh, the, the uh, linkages with the private sector and what should um, the um, public sector do, um, I think, that the most important thing uh, uh, that we settle down what is the necessity for the society and what we can do with um, this public money uh, to, to actually um, uh, empower all those people that they don't have sufficient skills for life and work in this society. Thank you.
Thank you, Emma. Dorota, you would like to, to be the last and uh, just noticing that our next speaker has also joined from OECD, but maybe let's hear from Dorota and then we try to make the link to the next uh, speaker as well. Of course, thank you so much for giving me the floor uh, to be the last one of this panel. Well, what, what could I say? I mean, I, I had a couple of um, comments that I noted down on the private sector involvement in uh, in the education, lifelong learning, training. Um, and I agree with uh, what Borheen said about the, the principle of equity, the rights-based based approach uh, to a kind of uh, be the shining, um, I, I'd say, beacon. Uh, uh, towards which one we, we, we should then go be it from a public uh, private perspective. Um, I, I think um, I, I think it's a journey that we um, definitely should embark on. But if I can just offer um, a couple of um, uh, learnings from a public health perspective, so working on the commercial determinants of health, as we have, um, uh, we have to be we have to be careful and really take on it from this precautionary perspective, because what what we've seen from the involvement of uh, be it you know uh, food drink industry, um, uh, gambling industry, uh, tobacco alcohol etc cetera, etc, cetera, um, there's always this um, uh, uh, trend to settle settle for. Uh, self-regulatory approaches, voluntary commitments, code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and take away um, the, um, the responsibility from the, from the private sector really to indeed a kind of work for the common good um, and take away the uh, um, uh, uh, accountability for what they should be doing. So uh, we have mixed results, I'd say. We have some, some good examples for work from working with uh, um, insurers, uh, social insurers, social investment funds, uh, banks, etc., in in green um, uh, areas uh, and and health enhancing uh, approaches. So, so I think definitely the potential is there. But I think um, uh, we're not there yet. So the work uh, has to um, has to. Uh, proceed and then anticipating for what uh, the OECD uh, perhaps the speaker uh, will talk about and I as I was listening to to the interventions that the input here and it's also a topic or approach that uh, we as a zero health net so from the public health perspective want to embark on is the um, the economy of well-being approach for example and I know this is something that uh, is uh, sits well within OECD, uh, sits well within a number of uh, uh, presidencies of the Council of the European Union. Finland started that, so uh, I think there is also a big potential to move towards that, and definitely in the in the context of the recovery and resilience building. Um, using the funds that we we have uh, for the next uh, years and and make sure it's really money well spent and not that in a in a number of years we you know again wake up um yeah we we wasted the opportunity as i'd say of the of the pandemic of course it's it's terrible devastating uh, consequences but uh, you know there is there is the momentum to uh, to rethink the way we we do politics we do policies policies that work for uh, for more than just for for a few and there are a number of uh, processes and policies at the eu level um, under the european pillar of social rights action plan you know there are plans for european care strategy uh, investments in uh, I know, child guarantee etc etc also in the health sector you know european health union uh, a bit broadened than uh, as we have it at the moment um so yeah, uh, I um, will listen very carefully to uh, to the OECD speaker, uh, thinking there will be definitely something that will say yes, that's uh, that's a way to go. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dorota, and thank you to to everyone uh, for this first part of the of the discussions. Uh, and then I would probably already invite our next uh, speaker from OECD, Andreas Schleicher. Please correct me. I'm not a German speaker, if it's this German. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so we have been discussing so far the links and the importance of um, investing in education and at the same time how it relates to the current uh, situation and well-being of learners and education training systems overall there was also a very nice comment uh, addressing this issue on how expensive it has become access to health and uh, to mental health in particular for uh, for learners so um, we are really happy to have you and uh, hear from what also OECD has been exploring in the last years uh, we know that there has been a lot of work around the issue of funding and well-being uh, including in PISA so happy to hear from you um, how to address this issue you on a different levels. Thank you for joining us again. Yeah, thanks so much for, for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. And, you know, often we see, you know, academic outcomes, education and well-being as kind of opposing ends of a spectrum, but it's really about uh, seeing them as two sides of the same coin. We have increasing evidence from this. And just, you know, to, to start as I let me just share a couple of, of, of slides with you. Uh, um, one in particular, you know, uh, on this chart, you see on the horizontal axis, a gross mindset that young people bring with them, the attitude, you know, that the sky is the limit, they feel well, they have this aspiration that they can actually advance. On the left side, you have a fixed mindset, you know, it's all about the intelligence I was born with. And then on the vertical axis, you see academic performance, and suddenly you can see actually the mindsets that we create among young people are our best predictor for the quality of an education system. Actually, that relationship you see here is much stronger than the relationship between, you know, class size or spending or teacher salaries and outcome. It's really, I think, something that we should take to heart. It's about mindsets, attitudes and aspiration. And uh, it's not just academic outcomes. We could see that students uh, with a gross mindset, were more motivated to master difficult tasks. They had a greater sense of self-efficacy. They were less afraid of failure, had more ambitious learning goals. You can see, suddenly see how this matters. And that was why we have at the OECD put a lot of effort recently on measuring student well-being and uh, social emotional kind of aspir <coughs> uh, perspectives. Uh, and I think this is the one lesson we all take away from the pandemic, that learning is not a transactional business it's always a social a relational enterprise now if you wanted to be a great teacher during this pandemic it wasn't enough to be a great uh, instructor you also had to be a great coach a great mentor a great facilitator a great social worker a great he <coughs> health worker now i think that's something that we have really seen so we looked at some aspects we looked at you know uh, uh, persistence and uh, responsibility of uh, people the, the way to manage their own emotions uh, the way they interact with other people, the empathy, trust, the open-mindedness, curiosity and creativity, and the way they sort of engage uh, in life. Now, so that's basically something that we studied. We don't have data for all regions, but we have a pretty sad kind of diverse uh, set of entities uh, with data on this. Now, let me just come back to the initial point that this is not in opposition to traditional learning, but actually, the other side of the coin, you can actually see where students, you know, were more persistent. They had greater persistence. They also could get better math marks in mathematics, uh, trust, curiosity. Those aspects were actually very strong predictors for academic performance. And then for the arts, you could see the same picture, actually, art performance uh, being very much dependent on those social and emotional uh, skills. When you bring in um, age and, and, and gender, you know, one of the most uh, disturbing findings from our study is that 15 year olds come out worse on most of those dimensions than 10 year olds. You know, if I would tell you that 15 year olds do worse in mathematics than 10 year olds, you would ask me, well, there must be something terribly wrong in our schools and social systems. No? But that's precisely what we see when it comes to social emotional skills and particularly for girls when you break this down by gender you can see actually that decline in well-being and social emotional skills is particularly pronounced uh, for girls 
we can also see that boys and girls have quite different perspectives on this. Now you can see there are real gender differences. Girls doing better on responsibility, achievement, motivation, empathy, cooperation, tolerance. But you know, boys showing greater levels of stress resistance, more optimism, better management of their emotions, more assertiveness and energy. And we can see those gaps are even larger when you talk about 15 year olds than about 10 year olds. Now, so once again, we don't often have that on our radar screen that actually the well-being of children can vary by social background, by gender in ways we don't see because often we don't have metrics to look at this in a schooling context. Now, let me just highlight one aspect and that is about creativity and curiosity. Now, here you can see for every region where we have data, 15-year-olds uh, report to be less creative than 10-year-olds. And some people say, well, that's also about psychology. 15 year olds are more self-aware, you know, more self-critical and so on. But actually when we ask parents and teachers, we got very much the same picture. And so there's something real going on that our education systems take things away from young people. But there are things that we can do. For example, students participating in arts activity uh, showed higher levels of creativity. That's, I think, an, an important perspective that the arts are actually one way how we can, you know, nourish and enhance that kind of cap capabilities as it is so important in tomorrow's world. No? Uh, I think uh, the memorization of academic content is a small part of our success tomorrow. Actually, our, our, our curiosity, creativity are going to be a much bigger part of this. No? So let me turn about to uh, conclude with, you know, some thoughts on student well-being. We used an index of the World Health Organization, and you can see when you look at 10 year olds, most 10 year olds say, well, you know, my daily life is filled with things that interest me. I woke up uh, feeling fresh and rested. I felt active and vigorous. These are all quite positive indicators for about 60% of 10 year olds. But it also means for 40% that is not true. And if you look for at 15 year olds, you can see the bars get a lot shorter and particularly so for girls. Now the bar for girls is a lot shorter than for boys and for both, it's a lot shorter than for 15 year olds. So generally, you know, well-being is an issue. Now, again, you know, psychologists have explanations for this, but if we see those patterns, our schools need to be much more holistic environments where we care about those aspects and not just academic learning outcomes. Now, some people say, well, you know, psychological well-being is harmed by competition in school or by parents being too ambitious or, or, or teachers having too high expectations. That's not what we find in our data, actually. We see that actually a competitive school climate, positive engagement of parents, high expectations, high expectations from teachers were actually quite positive predictor for the well-being of students. So once again, education is not a transactional business, it's always a social and a relational enterprise and where you have those expectations, outcomes are better. But of course, you know, expectations raise anxiety. And I think that is also something we should be aware that we have many young people these days that actually <laughs> go to school with a quite worried kind of mindset. And this is for 10 year olds. You can see that also true for 15 year olds. Now, some people say, well, if young people are, you know, anx anxious about tests, we should be less demanding and, you know, well-being is about leveling down your expectations. But, and it looks on the surface true. You know, when you look, for example, at the picture for girls, you can see the well-being of students is negative related to test anxiety. Uh, girls that are more worried about tests tend to feel lower levels of well-being. But when you look at this in a little bit more detail, you see it's not so simple. Now you can see a country like Korea, the city of Daegu here, very demanding on young people. You know, there's no, no education system in Europe that has that kind of pressure on young people. But as you can see here, they don't, the students don't feel so worried about uh, the, these tests and they're actually quite happy with their lives. You compare that with Finland, you know, Finland, uh, actually students don't get tested and still they're very anxious about it. And they're not that happy with their lives. So, and the same, by the way, for boys. And there are some factors underpinning this. Now, it has to do with, you know, 
the stress resistance of students, their sense of optimism, uh, their energy. Now, those are basically the, the kind of protectors of young people against the anxieties they face. It's not the level of expectations or the pressure on them, it's the lack of support, emotional support that many young people feel. Now, and now you ask yourself, where does that emotional support come from? And you'll find the answer here. It's basically all about the quality of relationships in schools. You know, you can see where teachers, where students had stronger relationships with their teachers, they were more resistant to stress. They had a greater sense of optimism. They had more emotional control. And you can see that's also true for every as other aspect of social emotional skills uh, that we measure. So what does this mean for public policy for investment in education is that we, you know, should see education in a more holistic way, give teachers more time to relate with their students as individuals, not just in the transmission of subject matter knowledge. Some education systems are very good at that. If you look to Estonia, if you look to Denmark, teachers have a lot of space, a lot of opportunities to engage with individual students. Now they have time out of formal classroom les lessons. There's a lot of kind of opportunity for this. What really matters is that teachers are not just, you know, know their subjects and how different students learn that subject differently, but they really know their students as individuals. I know some people say that's not the role of teachers. You should hire social workers and psychologists for this. But once again, the education systems doing these things best have actually you know, broadened that mission, that mandate of teachers so that teachers themselves see themselves as as uh, as uh, with these kind of holistic responsibilities not easy to achieve because it's really about you know making school a whole of society enterprise rather than just a you know a factory for the delivery of learning but again i think we see some schools doing really well on this and what you can see here is how much that matters it was the first time that we were able to see that because it's the first assessment of social emotional skills that we have in a comparative way, but I think it's an important perspective. Thank you very much. That's a lot of uh, interesting uh, data uh, and a lot of uh, information, um, some of it quite in line with what was also our annual theme and the position paper we have produced this year uh, that it links um, well-being with assessment methods, so with the testing and standardized testing. Uh, and I, I did hear you commenting on the fact that not necessarily they are correlated, but I guess it's also a question of culture. So um, testing culture can be different in, in, in around the globe and therefore its impact on well-being can also be different. So maybe that uh, requires further research on the culture um, differences as well. Um, but yeah, in our position paper, we do see uh, quite a link to anxiety uh, from tests and uh, with uh, well-being. Um, you also, um, well, you mentioned this social uh, relations and social interactions. Definitely, we all agree on that. It was mentioned before and I think uh, in different uh, education systems or so being like the formal education system or non-formal education, we have different experiences when it comes to that. For instance, we would tend to see the non-formal education uh, learning environments tend to have a much better emotional uh, and, and better relations between the teacher, the education educator and the, and the learner. Uh, so maybe this is also something that we need to bridge the gap between different uh, learning environments, how they can learn from each other on that aspect as well. But okay, it was a lot of uh, information and uh, I am very inspired, but uh, we'll leave maybe the floor to uh, the speakers and the participants to also interact, ask questions if they have. Uh, it will be uh, interesting to hear from, from the others as well and not a use of my moderation power um, and you can also obviously use the chat as well to raise questions anyone would like to ask a particular question to uh, to Andreas raise your hands or yeah I see Emma already from the uh, yeah so thank you Andreas for for this very comprehensive presentation in a very short period of time I mean it's really impressive how do you handle these numbers and how do you actually present them so um, we could say um, in a holistic way but also understandable because um, 
it's um, many, many researches behind it. Um, but I would turn maybe um, to our practice, I mean, our present situation that we have uh, in the education sector. Um, well, we are in a way pretty much aware, at least professionals, um, that they're working in developing sector uh, for education, uh, that we need to actually empower uh, children and all the students with these social emotional um, components and uh, competences. Um, so we have a kind of um, debate on a national level. I mean, all kinds of um, stakeholders are involved in it, uh, in the research um, development sector, but also in practice. Um, so we are exchanging uh, the good practices and the, the uh, already done projects on that. Uh, so uh, in the past period of ESF funds, we have been developing this, um, we could say the package of projects, um, how to uh, succeed um, safe and learning environment in the, in the schools and in, uh, we could say in a formal uh, school system. Um, but now we are on the way, um, well, actually, just to build up this cross curricular um, uh, topics, which is um, uh, focused on um, digital, but also sustainable and financing. <laughs> uh, but um, on the other hand, um, this mental health um, and uh, also social skills are very important. And in the history in Slovenian school system was really, I mean, um, present that uh, the, the whole personality of teacher was important. His behavior and his attitude to students. And in last few decades, I think two of them, we lost these manners in a way, uh, but not entirely as we realized through the, these projects that uh, we actually have been um, uh, running in last five years. Um, so it's still a hope. I do have it as a pedagogue and andragogue. Uh, so um, it's really inspiring that we have uh, this data that we could lean on and build up the policies on that. Thank you for it. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I think this distinction between the curricula and the extracurricular is probably a distinction of the past. I do believe, particularly when it comes to social and emotional learning, that actually it's always the context that actually shapes this. And a lot of learning takes place. <laughs> Schools are very good to keep students inside and the rest of the world outside. And I do think in the future, we need to find better ways to integrate different learning spaces and to configure space, time, people, technology in ways that they actually develop students in the more holistic way. Uh, I must also say, you know, the last decades, and it's not just about Slovenia, you can see this everywhere in Europe, we have seen a trend towards sort of commodifying education, you know, students became consumers and teachers are looked at as service providers and parents as clients. And that actually has been actually countering that, 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 and I think we need to find our way back to creating that kind of whole of society enterprise that education is and a lot of that has been uh, is about work organization when you think about resources you know in the last uh, decade we have invested a lot in you know, teacher assistants and uh, school psychologists and so also on but uh, at the same time we have taken things away from teachers you know we have made teaching more and more narrow focused on the transmission of knowledge and actually that has made the job of teachers less inspiring, less interesting, because when you ask people, why did you become a teacher? It's never to teach mathematics, it's to you know, help people grow, develop. We've taken that away from, from teachers a bit. And I think uh, that is something we should probably you know, revisit. Yeah, thank you. I see Dorota, your hand is raised and then Russell. And then we will try to bring in also the member of the parliament, Maxova, who I see has been <coughs> with us. Uh, thank you for being with us. So first Dorota maybe, and then Russell. Uh, I think uh, Russell has taken over the screen. <laughs> thank you. Can I? Yes, can I speak? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much 
uh, Andreas, I have a question. It's um, it's it's always very inspiring and exciting to uh, to discuss. Um, but then, when it comes to the transfer of the um, of the evidence, the data, um, uh, you know, the, the indicators, and and all the uh, um, nice things that we are talking about, and take it to actually to the policymakers, and specifically the those who are in charge of of the budgets, the finances, the economy, to to make sure actually it's it's our um, arguments are uh, listened to and factored in the policies that are being made. I actually have a question. I, I'm, I, I'm aware of the fact that OECD has launched today the economic outlook um, for all the countries uh, of the OECD. Um, and I, just purely, purely out of curiosity for my own country, which is Poland, I did a, um, a very quick kind of look, you know, how education is included in it as a, you know, recommendation that we uh, recommend Poland to, to invest in the educational system and all these things that, um, that we've talked about, um, uh, social emotional well-being, uh, investments in, in uh, teachers, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, can you can you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about how and how far uh, your data, your evidence, actually reaches those economic outlooks and and then is being kind of actually put forward to the uh, consideration for the economy economy and finance uh, ministries? Um, yeah, because from a public health perspective, we have often uh, uh, troubles in, in reaching those um, uh, tables or uh, sitting at the tables when those discussions are, are being made. And I'm not quite sure, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I think it might be also the case for the um, educational uh, stakeholders uh, like uh, we here uh, gathered. Thank you. Yeah, I think very good point. You know, I don't think education has been very good to, you know, uh, make its value proposition. Uh, the other sectors in our economies are much better in, you know, showing how additional investments will actually translate into long term economic outcomes. But at the OECD, actually, we do have very strong data, you know, um, the link between the quality of education and uh, long term economic growth is uh, very, very robust and very strong. And uh, countries in Asia have been much better to capitalize on this. You know, they they would not put education on the consumption side of public budgets. They always see them as on the investment side and they look at, you know, how to actually those investments translate into superior outcomes. One of the things that we should concede in education is that not all investments in the past have actually been effective in the sense of improving the quality. Like we've invested a lot of money into smaller classes on the premise, oh, well, that's going to improve academic outcomes and social emotional well-being. There's no link actually that you can see empirically. I think if you want to actually see better social emotional skills mm -hmm. you need to give students different forms of learning experiences make learning more authentic make learning more problem-based project-based now those are the kind of experiences uh give young people a greater role in co-creating uh learning experience <laughs> i think technology can also be a very powerful lever there so i think it's not just about more money it's about the the, the right investments but i think the, the the evidence and data and you you can see it in the economic outlook you can see it in much of our work. Uh, it actually the link between you know education today and the economy tomorrow is 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 scaringly strong. Basically, you know our schools today are our economy tomorrow, and if we get that part wrong, actually it's very very hard to fix. Basically, uh, we and it's not just you know, on the economic side; it's a question of of you know social participation, cultural participation. All of that really hinges on. And, and, and at the OECD, we, we do have good data on that. <clears throat> Thank you. I guess we are bad at really showing the value then, because really, how yeah. is it possible that the policymakers are not picking up on this, which is an evidence that you have, and I think many of us have been trying to also uh, state. I, I see Rasa. Yeah, you wanted to react maybe, Andreas, but maybe let's see yeah. also. Yeah, and just to say that I, I think, you know, sometimes education stands in its own way. Like we yeah. actually often object to making an economic argument about it. We argue mm. education on a rights based perspective or kind of on a values based perspective. But actually, I think that economic argument is very powerful as well. 
And that's, you know, why do countries like, you know, Vietnam, China make so huge investments in education these days? Because they understand those kinds of relationships and act on that. Mm, indeed. <clears throat> Russell, you wanted to come in? Uh, you are muted, so maybe you can unmute yourself. Oh, we can help you. Yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. Good. Um, we can hear you now. Hit the screen quick enough. Uh, too many notes. I want to first of all congratulate Andreas on that fabulous presentation and the graph. Uh, it was amazing, and uh, I would have loved to have been live in the room with you when you were presenting that. Uh, the late Sir Ken Robinson uh, talked about um, education killing creativity and how we, um, we kind of gear children up to fail, especially in the UK. We tend to teach them to achieve grades rather than to help them develop. Um, and and there, is a, there is a saying that, that, that goes around about how it's easier to, uh, to build a, a child than to repair a broken adult. Um, and I know from personal experience, and I, I can see you smiling, uh, I love that little comment at the end then about how education can get in the way and my wife's a great example of this uh, she's retired from teaching now been retired for about five or six years uh, but when she entered teaching in the early 70s she entered it to develop and grow children um, and over the years that was kind of knocked out of teachers that enthusiasm was taken away and it was replaced by the curriculum and attainment targets and you know the next Ofsted uh, report that was coming in because that was the grades that the school used to use to try and attract more children to their school and uh, I'd love your comments on that. Yeah you know uh, first of all on the adults and children and particularly for social emotional skills you know unfortunately brain sensitivity uh, diminishes rapidly on this you know empathy is a skill for a three-year-old is a personality trait for a 20 year old. There's actually very little you can do to change some of those. Now, so I, mm. particularly when it comes to social emotional learning, we do have very, very important opportunities, almost like language learning. Now, for, for us as, as adults, it's really hard to learn a language. For children, it's very natural. No? So I think that's important. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I think our education systems have been very much instrumentalized and actually that uh, served a purpose in the past. In the industrial age, it was about making people compatible with the, you know, ways of <coughs> working of machines. We, we know how to educate second class robots, you know, people who are very good to repeat what we tell them. But in a time where the kind of things that are easy to teach and test have become easy to digitize, that is no longer the point. And I think this is something that hasn't got through public policy. I think there's a lot of kind of uh, misconception of what education uh, can be about. And, you know, social emotional skills are not so remote. You actually figure that out when you do your first job interview. You know, of course, they look at your grades, but actually how you come across, you know, how you accept mm -hmm. yourself, how you interact, <laughs> that's what's creating the social divides in our countries. You know, we actually, mm -hmm. uh, have now uh, often, you know, disadvantaged kids get, sometimes get quite good mm -hmm. grades. You know, I think we have done a lot on moderating mm -hmm. those inequalities, but on those character qualities and social emotional skills, they are mm -hmm. the determining kind of feature later. Mm -hmm. That's so true. When I sit on interview panels, which I do at the university sometimes, I mean, everybody's got qualifications. They come with more qualifications yeah. than I could wallpaper my office with, yeah. but it's the person I'm interested in it's their social skills, it's what they're interested in, you know, what they've been involved in. And uh, I think we've just put so much emphasis now on grades, qualifications and certificates that often people have, uh, get, uh, children have got missed on the way. But that's where resources come in. You know, if you go to a, you know, elite uh, British private school, their differentiator is not, you know, three points more in mathematics. Their differentiator is entirely on those kinds of other attributes. And mm. wealthy parents know how important those skills are. They make those mm. investments. They give their children these extracurricular op opportunities and that's making the difference. Mm. And therefore, even if schools do a perfect job in getting everybody the same grade, the social disparities will remain because, because of that. No. Unless we pay more attention to this and build that into our metrics. That's really what, what I argue for. You know, I know all the difficulties but I think you can never improve what you cannot see. <clears throat> Thank you. Definitely. 
Thank you. And I see one last hand because um, we are all aware of our own health and the screen time that uh, one of our speakers during this week was saying should be cut by half. Uh, that half can be different from each of us today, but uh, maybe let's uh, give the floor to Burhain from UNESCO for one last comment, and then we give the floor to, to the member of the parliament. Thank you, Brikin, and uh, thank you, uh, thanks, uh, Andreas, as, as usual, for uh, in quite important uh, finding, I think, of the work that uh, was done uh, a few weeks ago and was published. Uh, I mean, we have seen from, uh, just to, to go into what Andreas was saying, we have seen from uh, the data we have been collecting that uh, uh, some countries have set up quite important mechanism to support the, uh, the social, emotional and the well-being, uh, developing resources, uh, training teachers, creating communication between the schools and the parents, so there are measures that can be effective in, in, in making this happen. And I think it's important that we, we take into account what governments can do and what the national stakeholders can do, including the civil society and communities in, in this context. But I think um, uh, as we, the, the topic of this uh, uh, event is about uh, the investment in lifelong learning. I think where we are still very bad, I think, uh, is uh, there are a few things where we still have to work further. One is that, and uh, it was mentioned earlier, we are still very bad in connecting the learning settings. We are still very bad in doing that, uh, both in terms of uh, building the learning pathways, creating a mechanism for uh, recognizing, valuing learning, e even the vi validation of prior learning. We have seen, I mean, you have a very big Mercedes for roles that are very, very uh, tricky. And uh, even the, in the countries that have put quite important uh, investment in, in validation of prior learning, like France, Portugal, the numbers have been uh, growing, but then they, they stunned. So they, I think connecti connecting the learning uh, settings, leveraging the technology remains uh, uh, an unfinished business. The second is how we bring uh, the low skilled and low adult to uh, lifelong learning opportunities. I think we still uh, didn't find uh, uh, the, the right uh, equation, and, and probably it, it has to we ha it has to bring a new dimension that we didn't take into account, including what uh, uh, we discussed with Russell earlier, is that how we take a whole of a person needs and not only the learning dimension of it. And the last piece I think is uh, is about the international dimension and, and uh, the cooperation and solidarity. It's very important uh, that we in in a context like uh, the European context. Uh, Europe shouldn't be Eurocentric. It has to look at uh, what is happening elsewhere. It has to be part of this uh, engagement with uh, with other countries. And it's very important that uh, the voice of uh, the lifelong learning community in Europe is also engaged with the with the global lifelong learning community. And that's what uh, I would call for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any last reaction, Andreas? I, I know that the member of the parliament has to leave. So if she's still with us, actually, because, ah, yes. So um, that, can we give Andreas a last word to, to close on the comment from Borhain and then the floor to you, uh, Ms. Maxova, right? Okay, thank you very much. No, I, I very much agree with Borhain, but I think to get, you know, all the learners back into education, has a lot to do with the attitudes and expectations that we create early on. You know, many there are actually more, many more opportunities for lifelong learning than what what people actually use. And that it, as a general trend, the kind of learning opportunities tend to reinforce the attitudes that we had have created. If school has been a misery to you, you know, it's the last thing you want to do in your life. If your employer sees you're not so greatly skilled, then they're not going to be making investments in you. So I think we need to tackle those kinds of uh, issues, but I, I very much agree with this point. Thank you very much for for um, joining us and and uh, yeah, sharing your your work. Um, giving the floor now to you, uh, Ms. Maxova. Thank you for uh, also uh, being with us at this. Uh, I know you have to close, so uh, it's a difficult topic we addressed here, trying from one side to discuss investment and on the other side well-being, not that they are opposite to each other, but very complex each on their own. Uh, so thank you for, for uh, being with us and I leave you the floor for the last words and then to our vice president to wrap up. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, dear speakers, uh, dear participants, first of all, let me thank the organizers for this great event, important even complex event, and to all the speakers for their insightful presentation. For us as policymakers, uh, it is truly important to hear and listen to as many experts' opinions as possible, especially on such difficult topics. I would like to focus my time here on an issue of aging of the European workforce and on the education of elderly. The European Commission has this year introduced the green paper on aging, which opened up a discussion about how to best include older citizens in the labor market and outline the importance of lifelong learning as a key tool in addressing the upcoming green and digital transition. The European pillar of social rights outlines what a just transition should like, uh, look like. All citizens have the right to education, training and lifelong training. It is our job to ensure that all citizens have access to the education and training opportunities needed to take full advantage of new work opportunities. We need to make sure that all citizens are equipped with the skills needed to function in an increasingly digitalized world. And uh, we need to make sure that these transitions are inclusive, socially just, and that everyone can participate. However, legislation isn't everything. According to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, there is a big difference in how much citizens of different EU member states engage in lifelong learning. In Denmark and other Nordic countries, more than half of the workforce tends to engage in learning or training at least once a year. In countries like, uh, like Italy, Hungary or Lithuania, this share drops to less than a quarter. These dis disparities uh, in attitude towards lifelong learning are no surprise when we take into account the different levels of education funding as well as various approaches to teaching and learning. Denmark spends almost 8% of its GDP on education and about fifth of the Danish workforce engage in learning or training monthly. The funding of the education sector in the Czech Republic sits at around 4% of the GDP. Only one in 20 workers participate in learning or training monthly. Nevertheless, these numbers are a clear impulse for us to engage in a real discussion about how our socioeconomic circumstances, well-being and the relationship with education shape our engagement with lifelong learning. We need to make sure that everyone, regardless of socioeconomic background, is provided with good quality education, which puts the individual at the center. Each person should be mean, meaningfully involved in the, the direction of their learning, which should be based on collaboration and open dialogue. For this, the EU should foster even more a lively exchange of best practices on all levels, which also includes teacher mobility. We need to ensure good quality access to education for everyone. In more remote areas and low populated regions, opportunities for lifelong learning can be low as closest education establishment are long distance to travel. Investment in high quality uh, broadband connection is needed as well as funding to in infrastructure and transport. Access to digital education for everyone is important not only for communication but also for distance learning and access to good quality healthcare which is shifting online to be more accessible to older people with mobility issues on inhabitants of rural areas. The upside to living in remote areas is that the quality of life tends to be considered better thanks to cleaner air and a stronger sense of community fostering a strong feeling of community, as well as intermixing of generation, leads to tackling another problem when it comes to well-being, loneliness. 
30 million adults in the EU report frequently feeling lonely. Certaining learning activities around communal spaces, such as libraries, can lead to a more positive attitude towards learning, as it is now connected to the social aspect as well. Intergenerational learning, mentoring and informal experience sharing can take place too under such conditions. The impact of social exclusion and lack of opportunities for further learning harms the mental health of older persons. This was further worsened by the pandemic-related lockdowns, especially when it comes to citizens in residential care. By developing digital skills, and intergeneration cohesion, such citizens can be more involved in the community and society. Lifelong learning also delays the onset of dementia and the decline of cognitive skills. Lifelong learning and inclusion in the evolving labor market offer feelings of achievement, satisfaction and fulfillment, as well as belonging. Continuous investment in learning helps older people remain employable and increases their confidence. The European Agenda for Adult Learning facilitates European cooperation to reinforce upskilling. Some of its initiatives are a system of micro credential, uh, credential that help lifelong learning by properly recognized. Individual learning accounts to help fund training opportunities for employees, as well as a Europass for easy communication of skills. It's important to account for the difference in the experience of women. The EU gender equality strategy targets gender inequalities in older age. Since women more often engage in part-time work to support their household, and have to interrupt their careers to have children, there is a significant gender pension gap. Considering pension is the single most important source of incoming for seniors, this significant affects the accessibility of lifelong learning opportunities for women. Women also often end up as unpaid career for ill relatives or relatives with disabilities or their pension is used to support unemployed relatives. All in all, it's clear we need to see more investments into adult education, especially focusing on the elderly citizens. Unfortunately, adult education is still often being seen as something not crucial and more as a hobby than something that can have an enormous effect on our lives. Without proper lifelong learning strategy and investments, we are risking leaving many people without skills and means to fully participate in our fast changing society. I am extremely happy that events like this are taking place to tackle this issue and to foster new ideas on how to make our education system better, as well as a more healthy place and inclusive place for all people. Thank you very much for your participating and um, I am enjoying very much our cooperation in the future. Okay, thank you very much um, for the discussion. I think uh, I will just wrap up very, very quickly because I can see that uh, people are already leaving. It was a very interesting discussion and I'm quite sure that the lifelong learning platform will will take uh, very good notes from here. I think that uh, the main ideas I, I got up were, for example, that uh, education and training, uh, especially when we link them with other contexts where lifelong learning happens, such uh, so meaning non formal and informal contexts, uh, they are a key to well being. They make people more confident and empowered. And so it provides uh, learners to be agents of change like we all want them uh, to be uh, in, a, in a ladder. Um, I was also, I really enjoyed seeing the idea of the three steps that Mr. Sakrum brought us here today, uh, referring for a better support as key for a better support for uh, the investment on education the resources, the equity in access uh, and the efficiency. 
I think that uh, uh, the idea of having these lifelong learning policies, which are already in place, several of them. So uh, uh, I think that at some point uh, someone said we already have the tools. So the question is how to see them in a more holistic way and integrate it with other non-educational uh, policies, such as demographic policies, climate policies, technology, technological um, policies, etc. And if we see them as a non-fragmented thing, we might have a better use of uh, the investment we put uh, on all of them. Um, I would also like to emphasize uh, and to finalize um, the, the, the role of educators on the well-being. I think this was somehow touched by the, the OECD uh, speaker, um, Mr. Andreas. Um, he, he even mentioned that uh, the, the, the educators, uh, not necessarily the teachers, but the educators in general, they were during the pandemic and they still are um, uh, coaches. Uh, we could also say psychologists. They, they play a, a, a very important role in, in education and lifelong learning. So we should also uh, take a good look uh, to, to uh, to these educators as key for bridging life and home context and learning context uh, um, where, where uh, learning happens. So I would uh, finalize by saying uh, something, some, some words that or someone already said, let's not lose the momentum. Uh, so let's use the momentum, for example, for a better advocacy on lifelong learning to work on education and well-being and to make good use of the funds that are already there. And um, so this is, I think, the, the main message that uh, we as Lifelong Learning Platform can take home from here and work on it uh, for, for the future. Thank you all for being here with us today. It was a very rich discussion from my point of view, and I think we all agree on that. We all took good notes of the messages and um, hope you enjoy the rest of the week and the events.